Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mina Jane. I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Memorial Library in Lexington, Massachusetts. Very happy to be bringing you this uh, program, our very first history cafe. We used to have a science cafe, and I was like, well, you need to do a history one. So this is our very first history cafe. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the program in just a minute, but I just wanted to say a few things. Um, I wanted to say we are recording this session. It will be on YouTube um, hopefully later today, and I'll send you all that link. Um, we are, we're using the, both the Q&A and the chat for questions. So if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A. If you have a comment or a tech issue, you can put it in chat. But we will be monitoring the chat too if questions come through. So no worries, we're paying attention. Um, I do want to say thank you to our library foundation, which um, supports all of our library programming. We did this program and are doing this program in um, partnership with the Lexington Historical Society. And Sarah McDonough is here to talk just for a minute about what they're up to. Hi. So we're very excited to be able to join you for this program tonight. Um, we do have a few other things uh, in store over at the Historical Society, some things that we'll be doing with the library and some things that we'll be doing on our own. Um, our book club is going to be starting up next month, um, which is really fun if you haven't uh, joined that before, which is for nonfiction history books. Our first one is going to be about Dr. Benjamin Rush, which should be great. And then we are almost ready to announce our fall run of our Cronin Lecture Series. Um, so we're hoping to have some really great upcoming events for you all and potentially uh, even having some outdoor tours that we can have in person, far apart, but in person. Um, so do keep an eye on the Lexington Historical Society website, which is lexingtonhistory.org in the future for more information. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so without further ado, Christoph Strobel is a professor of history at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. And some of you that came in early know that my son graduated from there, so I know it's a good school, where he teaches various courses in Native American and global history. He has numerous books out and essays and, and um, academic and has written in academic journals. And we're really, really pleased to have him here. Now, I have to say that when I um, wanted to do this kind of program, and you might know that this is 2020 is the 20, 400th anniversary of the pilgrims coming to Plymouth Rock. I think it's like later in November, December that the date's kind of um, undecided. But um, I really wanted to do a program on it, but I also wanted to do it in a way that was um, more realistic to the actual impact of the pilgrims coming to the New World. And um, I had heard wonderful things about Christoph Strobel. And so when I reached out to him, he immediately had this idea to do this kind of program. So I was really, really um, appreciative of that, that immediately he knew exactly what I was talking about and came up with a program that fit exactly what I was looking for. So I'm very appreciative of him. So without further ado, again, <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Christoph. And um, again, ask any questions. We will be feeding them to him during and uh, after his presentation. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Mina, uh, the Lexington Library, Sarah, and the Lexington Historical Society for having me. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is tough for me because I am not really a Zoom or virtual guy. I actually like to be in person in the room and like read the audience, ask questions, um, interact with the audience, see confused faces. Uh, ask follow-up questions. And so, um, as we all know, when we are on Zoom and we're talking, it's deadly silent. There's no other faces, but the own fa your own face that you're staring back to in this case, because everyone is on mute or, and, and, and the cameras are off. Uh, so that is a new Zoom reality, but given the COVID situation, I think it is still a way that we can intellect intellectually interact and, and, and learn about these things. So, um, with further ado, I think I am going to go into uh, share screen if it lets me. And uh, here we go. That should work. Um, so what is this talk about? Um, well, what we're going to do today is pretty much a crash course in Native American history of New England. So we're going to take a huge chunk of time 
and we're all going to be done by the end of the talk and 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 hopefully everyone will have learned a little bit about Native American histories and the broader contours of, of, of Native American history. As Mina pointed out, we have the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the Mayflower. They would have gotten on the boat about right now and then shipped over, hung out around Cape Cod for a while, and then finally ended up at Plymouth Plantation sometime in December. Um, and it was a tiny ship not really all that important, small group of people. Uh, we're not really talking about the Puritan separatists much here, um, but it is an important event in American history and, and, and maybe also in American myth-making because there had, there, there had been Europeans here before, French, Spanish, they even had been English colonists in Virginia but we have this thing that Mina referenced earlier, which is the Thanksgiving holiday. And I think the Mayflower and as we now call them the pilgrims, although they didn't call themselves that way and that's a term that, that only emerged later, um, the pilgrims um, have, or, or, or the Puritan separatists have come to play a much larger role in American mythology because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And so it was really sort of this event that happened about a year after uh, the, the Puritans had been established that they had a meal and which some Native Americans attended. And there's Wampanoag versions of the event, which are very different from those of the pilgrims. But it is this event that uh, some Puritan families and then some New England families continued to celebrate this Thanksgiving uh, dinner. And then it was during the Civil War that, that Abraham Lincoln uh, made this Thanksgiving holiday a national holiday, a, sort of as, a, as an event to try to create unity in a Civil War, uh, in, a, in a Civil War United States. Um, to make a long story short, since then, innumerable children have dressed up as Puritans, sometimes still as Native Americans, and it's become sort of part of the broader Native American, uh, of the broader American story and, and the way we see the founding of this, this country happening. Um, but the history of indigenous peoples on whose land the English moved, they are often a marginal part or a neglected part in this founding myth of New England and America. And so what we're going to do today is look at case studies and, and several uh, historic sketches and some biographies to try to explore the history of, of Native Americans in this region. And so some of the stuff we'll be talking about isn't particularly pretty. Uh, there's issues of colonization, dispossession, racism, a lot of death and despair. Uh, but I, what I also want to emphasize uh, today in my talk is the continuous presence of Native Americans in New England, that uh, we still have indigenous communities all over New England today, and they have survived despite often very harsh and unfavorable circumstances. So this is what we're in for today. And I kind of want to start out with an issue um, that um, sorry, um, that has been debated uh, at length at least in some circles around uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And this is the, um, the flag of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the state seal. And it's been a controversial issue to some, some people uh, in the Commonwealth want, to, uh, want the Commonwealth to abolish the seal. Other people see it as, well, it's just another PC issue, political correctness attack. Why do we really need to deal with this? Um, I don't wanna get into the debate whether we need to abolish the seal or keep it, but what I want to talk about and tell the audience a little bit about is what the seal stands for. And our current seal, which you can see uh, on the screen on the left-hand side, 
um, is based on the seal of uh, from the from the seventeenth century. It's the seventeenth century seal of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and what you see there is a Native American, uh, a Massachusetts Indian, very naked, uh, covered with some leaves, and he has a speech bubble coming out of his mouth saying, "Come over and help us." And it's pretty clear there's a lot of English imperial claims versus reality. Um, but, but this seal um, was redesigned and chosen as the state flag uh, in the 19th century. And while the seal at first glance, the, the new one that we have on the left in, in, in blue and white and yellow looks maybe better. Uh, the Native American is dressed uh, maybe more appropriately. Uh, he's not naked, which in Massachusetts or New England in general doesn't make much sense given our, our weather. Um, but what I like to talk about is look a little bit at this, at the seal and try to deconstruct it. And uh, the designer or other illustrator, a fellow named Edmund Garrett, he put a lot, he had very uh, detailed notes of uh, how he put the seal together. So we have a Native American on the picture. Uh, and it's kind of as one website that advocates for the abolishment of the, or for us to, to leave behind the seal, calls it, it calls it a Frankensteinian construction. And what you have here is the body of the Native American in the current state seal is based on a archaeological find of a dead Native American that was, uh, was found in Winthrop, Massachusetts. Then the head of the person is actually the face of a Native American from Montana. Now the belief by many in mainstream society in Massachusetts in uh, the 19th century is that Native Americans had disappeared they had intermixed with other groups and therefore there were no more real Native Americans in New England, which is kind of ironic because Massachusetts as many other parts of, um, of New England had still many or, or uh, several functioning indigenous communities that uh, did exist here. But it was sort of the sense at the time that Native Americans had disappeared uh, and, and therefore were gone and therefore the choice to bring in a person from, from, the, the, from the state of Montana rather than have an indigenous person from Massachusetts. Now, I wanna again underscore the separation of the head and, and, and the body. And you see an interesting hand and a sword above uh, the person's head. This sword is based on the sword of Miles Standish. Miles Standish was the, um, he was the guy that the uh, Mayflower uh, passengers hired as a military advisor. Uh, Miles Standish was supposed to, supposed to help them in issues of defense. And Miles Standish became the military commander of Plymouth Colony. And in one of the first military acts with the Massachusetts Indians in which the, um, the, Plymouth colonists were uh, aided by the uh, Wampanoag Indians. Uh, one of their indigenous, one of the Massachusetts natives had their head chopped off and the head was piked outside of Plymouth colony and left there to uh, spend some time on a pike. This is by the way, not a one time occurrence. Uh, this cutting off heads and piking also happened to King Philip, and incidentally, or, or also known by Metacom or Metacomet, who was the leader of an anti-colonial resistance fight uh, in the 1670s. And incidentally, the belt used on the seal is that of King Philip. And King Philip was one of several leaders, the famous uh, Wampanoag leader, Wiedemu, uh, Asunksqua, which pretty much means she was a, a, a female notable in Wampanoag society, also had her head cut off. King Philip's head was piked and left outside of Plymouth for several decades. Wiedemu's uh, head was piked outside of Taunton. 
So this is a, this, there's a long history with that. And this is why uh, several people take issue with the seal and, uh, and, and sort of see this as a little bit of a concerning history. And we can maybe pick this up in, in Q&A later on if people are interested. The other thing that I find rather interesting is the motto that you can see inscribed in Latin, Latin, and that is by the sword we seek peace. And we'll pick up with that uh, later on in the talk as well. All right, so I wanna make a quick contrast here, sort of the perceptions just as in 19th century that Native Americans might've disappeared. Uh, this is also a time, the 18th and 19th century into the 20th century, when we had a lot of local histories written. And Gene O'Brien, uh, a, a scholar at the University uh, of Minnesota and uh, an Anishinaabe uh, scholar, also has done a lot of very pathbreaking work on, on, on uh, New England. And, and she analyzed a lot of the uh, local histories uh, written in the 19th and early 20th century. And so when you read these histories, and I, I've read a lot of them, you always have these sort of like Native Americans lived in a wilderness. This was virgin land. They were no, nomads. And so Native Americans are sort of depicted as, as having low standards of living and, and, and roaming the lands. And so this is also reflected in a lot of the writings of early um, colonists. But when we actually study the deep historical records, so the archaeology, and 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 we read critically the early accounts of, of 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 European observers, and we study the oral histories of Native people, what we actually learn is that New England was not a wilderness; it was not a virgin land, and it was certainly not settled by quote unquote nomads. Uh, it was a region with uh, tremendous ecological stability and in a, in a day and age where we have a lot of environmental pro uh, problems, it's maybe a model that we can learn from. It was a region of extreme social complexity, uh, very ingrained societies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was also a region where agriculture was practiced. Uh, and yes, Native Americans were hunting for animals, but we also have to remind ourselves that there was a paucity of domesticatable, of domesticatable animals in New England or all of the Americas. So compared to Europe, Africa, or Asia, where there were plenty of cows, horses, uh, chickens, and other animals, pigs that could be domesticated, Native Americans had very few beasts of burden and other animals that could be domesticated. In North America, they had the dog, which was domesticated. In South America, in the Andes, there was also the alpaca and the uh, llama, which Native Americans also domesticated and used as beasts of burden. Um, but because of that paucity or the lack of um, domesticated animals, Native Americans came up with ingenious ways to procure meat. And they did this by managing the landscape. They burned woodlands to spur the undergrowth, uh, to thin the forest out, and it, it, it helped animal populations to grow, but also to facilitate easier hunting. And so while we mentally tend to think, oh, this is a hunting life ways, it's, it has actually in some ways the pre-Columbian ways of Native Americans in the Eastern Woodlands, so east of the Mississippi, has much more to do with free range pasture raising uh, than, than sort of with the traditional hunting where people go through deep woods, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The first colonists in their accounts, they talked about, described Native American forests as sort of spaced out. You could even like ride a horse and buggy into it. So these were well managed and well uh, kept landscapes by Native Americans. Native Americans in New England and all over North America are, are, are participated in sophisticated long distance exchange networks. And the history here goes back over 10 millennia. So to restate my point here again, 
while we are often still confronted with the myths of wilderness and, and nomadic Native Americans, we're really dealing with agrarian societies that are socially complex, where people might not have domesticated animals, but they came up with ingenious ways to procure meat. Uh, and they participated in long distance exchange networks or long distance trade for a very, very long time. So this is, this is the pre-Columbian uh, history. Uh, on this slide or in this section of the talk, I wanna explore the history before the arrival of the Puritan separatists or as they are often now called the pilgrims. So um, there was a strong uh, European presence in uh, New England before the arrival of the Mayflower. There were plenty of European fishermen that took advantage of the very rich coastal waters. There were, was the occasional shipwreck survivors. The European fishermen traded uh, with Native American populations for, for fur. So this came another side business for many of them. There was also a surprising amount of slave raiding that was going on. And this is a, a part of history that we tend to not talk about much, but New England was a slave raiding ground. There were French, Spanish, and a lot of English uh, ships that, that raided for slaves. And many of you are undoubtedly familiar with Squanto. What many less people are familiar with is how was it that Squanto was able to speak so well in English with, uh, the Plymouth colonists and how could he teach them how to farm? How could he teach them how to navigate the waters uh, of Cape Cod Bay and, 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 and the Southern New England shore? Well, Squanto, or as he should actually be called Tisquantum, Squanto is sort of the diminutive of his, his, his name, Tisquantum, was of, uh, of an important uh, Wampanoag family. And he was one of many New Englanders that have been captured and then by, by a crew and they attempted to sell him into slavery. And he was rescued by Franciscan monks and through various loops made it to England. There worked for the invest, one of the major investors who, who in overseas colonization, especially New England and through various steps made it back to New England. And this is just one of many examples of, of, of the history of, 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 of slave raiding uh, and how Native Americans were impacted. Colonization at this time and before made, had a huge environmental impact that became escalated with colonization. Alcoholism started to become an issue in indigenous communities. Uh, trade, like the fur trade, the coming of firearms also spurred internal warfare among indigenous communities. So uh, there's an increase of warfare, even all of this happening right out before the uh, Mayflower arrives in New England or the place we today call New England. And we've talked about um, the issue of domestic animals before, but this also has, not only does it require Native Americans to work and become hunters, but it also require, it also creates an issue for their vulnerability to disease. Because a lot of the, the disease, uh, diseases we have as human societies, we have obtained through animal populations and because Native Americans did not have these animal populations, they also found themselves incredibly vulnerable to Euro, Asian and African diseases. Um, and so because of every new disease hitting hard, like a, like a new disease, um, the impact of, uh, the, the, the impact that disease had on the indigenous population was quite dramatic. So scholars estimate that 
roughly between 50 to 90%, but probably closer to around 90% of the indigenous population uh, perished in large result uh, because of their vulnerabilities of disease. But also do not underestimate in this, in this context, also the impact that internal warfare has here, plays here, that slave raiding plays here. All of these had a dramatic factor on weakening uh, America's indigenous population and the indigenous peoples of the Northeast in particular. Um, so what does 1620 and the Mayflower mean for Native Americans? It's, it, is a, it means the history of colonization. It means dispossession. It means disease and mass mortality, as, as we've pointed out. It means atrocious warfare. It means humongous environmental impact because the very sustainable fisheries and shell fisheries and, 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 and deer populations, beaver population, they became uh, very rapidly uh, strained. It also is connected to the history of slavery. There's a, been a lot of talk recently about 1619 and its impact. But I mean, thinking about Squanto, I, I think 1620, 1620 as well should not be, uh, should also be understood as a, as having an impact on the history of slavery. A, the slave raiding that came in and happened before, but let's not forget that Massachusetts is the first English speaking colony to legalize and put slavery on the books. So we are, Massachusetts is the first colony to legalize slavery. And this is very much connected to the history of Native Americans. So there's a conflict in the 1630s between the New England colonies uh, they're Narragansett and, uh, and Mohegan allies against um, a, a Native American uh, society called the Pequot Indians. And the war goes very badly for the Pequot. There's a dramatic uh, massacre at, at Mystic. The whole town is burned. Uh, some 500, mostly women and children, are burned alive while they're surrounded and the people are trying to flee. They're getting shot. Uh, but it also led to the capture of a lot of uh, Native American or a lot of Pequot Indians. And so what happened with these Pequot, they were turned into uh, forced labor within the colony, especially in Massachusetts, a lot of them ended up. And so this, um, the presence of these Pequot, what was called war captives, uh, really let the elite of Massachusetts and Mass Bay Colony to sort of start a debate on what are war captives? Are we enslaving them? And it was this discussion that, that very much helped in the creation of a more legal, in a, in a legally in, uh, encoded system of slavery in Massachusetts Bay Colony. And it is also important to emphasize while Massachusetts quickly introduced uh, people of African descent to work as slaves, it was also many Native Americans, uh, many of them from New England, war captives like the Pequot, that then would also become uh, slaves within the colonies. And it is still into towards the end of the 17th century that Native American slaves actually make up a larger part of the slave population in Massachusetts and people of African descent. So there's the issue of slavery. There's the issue of racism. There's the issue of poverty. There's the issue of discrimination. And there is dismantling of communities and social challenges uh, that indigenous peoples face. But we also need to remember that indigenous people adapted. They proved to be extremely resilient. This is the way, the reason why we still have indigenous uh, communities in New England today. They survived, they, they showed their presence, they persisted, and they struggled to maintain their independence 
and sovereignty tooth and nail. And that's an important part of, of the 1620 and 2020 story as well. Um, by the sword, we seek peace. Uh, war um, is an important part of the story. Um, I picked King Philip's War just because you have to pick one. And there, there's many others. I, I already talked about the Pequot War. Uh, I could have talked about King William's War, Queen Anne's War, Dummer's War, which was not that it was a dumb war, but the governor was dumber. Uh, then there's King George's War, and there's a Seven Years War. And I realize my lame jokes probably work even less on Zoom than they work in real life. Um, but um, let's take King Philip's War. And, and on this point, it's next uh, on this picture is, is a depiction of Hannah Dustin, uh, who uh, was captured in King William's War, lost her baby during the capture, clearly very dramatized, uh, but then um, broke free, uh, killing the one male captor. captor uh, well, there were two male captors, one an old man and, and another man, while they were sleeping with two uh, other colonists that helped her, and in the process also killed uh, a woman and six children. Uh, and um, so these are the kinds of stories that we have all, all over New England. And this is, believe it or not, as we we're talking about Civil War statue, this is the first uh, statue for a woman, historic statue that, that represents a, a woman. And she, she has been in the news as of late. Uh, there's a statue in Haverhill. Uh, this picture is of a statue that I took a couple of weeks ago up in, uh, in New Hampshire. And you can even see it down at the knee, there's a little red pink on there from from the demonstrations that are taking place up there. Uh, so the war and the memory that by the sword we seek peace uh, is still very much part of our memory and commemoration and, and how we represent the past. And again, I'm not necessarily advocating you need to take these down. As with the seal, my job as a historian is for audiences, public audiences, because I have more time to think about these things to sort of do my little mini sermons as I do tonight to get people to think about, well, how do I feel about this now that I know the facts? Um, so what King Philip's war, switching gear, sorry, what King Philip's war did, uh, Metacom's war uh, in the 1670s, in Southern New England, the estimated population, and these are numbers uh, that could have been higher, maybe, maybe lower, was about 140,000 to 120,000. By, in the early 17th century. By 1670, the indigenous population in Southern New England had shrunk to 30,000. And the English population was about 50,000. So this is at the eve of King Philip's War. Now the war happened in 1675, 1676, at least in Southern New England. In Northern New England, it goes a little bit longer. And some historians estimate that seven out of 10 uh, and the 10, I guess, is behind Mina Jane's uh, Carrie Library sticker. Um, let's see if I can move this up. Yes, I can. Woohoo! Um, seven out of 10 Native Americans in Southern New England were likely killed as a result of King Philip's War. Over a thousand, some historians estimate two thousands, uh, were sold into Atlantic slavery. So this continuation of the history of slavery Maybe 1620, just like 1619, might be something we want to talk about. And then we have the Deer Island internment camp, which is this island on Boston Harbor where a lot of uh, allied, English allied Native Americans were actually put into um, some, some Native uh, people refer to as a concentration camp, were put on this island in very hard conditions. They were not supplied well with food. They weren't allowed to cut trees to build housing. So I don't know if, if many of you have been on Deer Island. I have been there two or three times. One time during a hurricane when it was storming and winding and it was a relatively mild day. And I was just imagining being out there in a, in a New England winter would just have been a, the most excruciating experience that, that, that a family could undergo. Um, again, we have a tiny marker there. There is a, a commemoration in the works and hopefully it will show up. Um, we have a lot of blind spots in, in our memories of these histories. 
And it also created a refugee diaspora so that a lot of people, uh, Native American people, pretty much just fled the region and moved to areas and joined communities outside of Southern New England where they felt this was more safe. So this is King Philip's War, but King Philip's War stands in for many of the wars that I had mentioned earlier. And the population shrinkage, the attacks, uh, the imprisonment, enslavement, uh, scalp hunting, uh, which was not only a Native American practice because uh, various colonial governments paid very good money to colonists and, and fighters to collect Native American scalps. That was all part of, of this history and part of the legacies as well. Uh, colon colonization, violence, and war are part of those legacies. Another legacy I want to look at is also the survival. Um, that Native people survived into the 9th, 18th, 19th, and 20th century, uh, either working in the system of slavery or many Native Americans also ended up in indentured servitude. Christianity played an important part in that role. Uh, William Apis, uh, who was a, a minister and also an, an activist, was one of many Native American ministers who who were Christians and who had churches. And these churches became uh, meeting points for Native Americans uh, that they built their communities around. Uh, William Apis also was an, an, an advocate for Native American political rights. So he was an, an outspoken writer in the 19th century on Native American issues. And so Christianity in the 18th and 19th century plays a very crucial role in the survival and the community and identity retention of indigenous peoples in New England. Native Americans worked in factories. Betsy Guppy Chamberlain, she worked up in one of the mills in Lowell. Uh, she also was a writer and several of her pieces, they first off deal with a lot of, um, um, women equality issues, but given her Native American heritage, she was also an active advocate for indigenous rights. And like William Apis, Betsy Guppy Chamberlain in the 19th century reminded New Englanders that Native Americans were still around, even though many New Englanders, white mainstream New Englanders did not want to see that reality. Native Americans played a disproportionately uh, high role in, uh, in the military. Uh, so Native Americans fought on the side of the English in various colonial wars, then Native American communities in, in the Northeast played a, a significant role in supporting the American Revolution in the War of 1812. Uh, Native Americans worked in the global whaling industry. Uh, they worked in agriculture. They worked as domestic la wor uh, labor. When you read 19th century accounts by mill girls, for example, they talk about Indian paddlers, Indian doctors, and Indian performers. They show up in newspaper accounts everywhere. And so there's still very much a visibility. Native Americans play an important role in the, in the logging industry in Northern New England. They're river drivers. Those are the people that take the, the timber down the rivers. In, they're in the tourism trades. Uh, they're in canoe making. Uh, so economically speaking, Native Americans are active. Politically speaking, people like Betsy Gump, Guppy Chamberlain and William Apis, Native Americans are very active in showing mainstream New England societies that they're very much alive and around. So I wanna pay some attention to the 19th century uh, very quickly because this becomes a very crucial um, moment for Native Americans in New England and, and sort of underscores the often unique character that, that indigenous history in New England has compared to other parts of the United States. And um, so I've, we've already mentioned that when we talked about the seal and the use of a a face that uh, was brought in from a Montana Native Americans that mainstream New England society was kind of like, yeah, 
Native Americans, not so much here. We need to bring in someone from Montana. And this had much to do with uh, the intermarriage and, that had happened in many indigenous communities in Southern New England, especially. Now, again, recall that I had talked about earlier that many Native Americans worked in the whaling industry and that they worked as soldiers or militiamen, both industries with extremely high mortality rates. So um, what happened is that there was a declining and often very rapidly and concerningly declining number of, um, of males in indigenous communities. And so many Native American women found a suitable partner outside of the community. So they intermarried with African-Americans and with some white uh, uh, or, or Euro-Americans, uh, many of them sort of of recent immigrant backgrounds. And so this complicated the identity of, 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 of Native American peoples in the minds of many in mainstream American societies. But for most indigenous communities, that wasn't the case. Uh, the, the men were integrated into community and the women and their offspring very much continued to operate and live in, um, in an indigenous framework. And they continued seeing themselves as indigenous frameworks. And just as immigrants uh, that come to this country come to see themselves as, as Americans, uh, the men that married into these communities too saw themselves after years and then decades of spending time in these communities, in these indigenous communities, also as part of that community. Uh, but yeah. Stop. Oh. Can I just ask a quick question? I am not sure if it fits right into here, but um, you can decide. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who says it's a very interesting talk. Notwithstanding the future Native Americans church communities, to what extent were Native Americans forced to convert to Christianity was there any retaliation against those who did not convert? And was there economic benefit to convert? No, no, that's absolutely true. And, and um, there, is, um, there is that. And white minister in the 16th, 17th, and well, not the 16th, well, in, in other parts, yeah. In the 17th and 18th century, they very much faced that. And so the story is, 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 is more complex. There is force on that. And, 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 and the, the question is absolutely correct. That said, in a lot of native communities, when indigenous people realize, oh, this is Samson Occam, he's a Mohegan, or this is Apis, he is a Pequot, uh, they tend to um, go to these communities and it, it becomes part of the important survival. Just like the, the praying towns in 17th century, yes, there is sort of a pressure by the colonial government to get native Americans to move to these communities. But I also think that for some native Americans, it becomes part of a way that Christianity is seen as a tool because it often comes with a guarantee to land. So uh, a community, a praying town community like Natick, they get a title to the land. Wamasi up where Lowell is now is another praying town. They get a couple of thousand, 2,500 acres of land, which isn't much, but it provides them with some uh, security there and so on. So the history of Christianity is, is rather complex in that area. And, and I hope I'm not confusing the, the audience or, or the, the questionnaire. And we can certainly revisit this in, in the timeout uh, towards the end. So oh, thank this you. Is, this is the awkward Zoom silences. Um, I'm, I do not want to talk for longer than, um, I think I've been at it for about, uh, uh 40 minutes or so uh and i'm i'm trying to to wrap this up so we have more time for for excellent questions like that that will have in the help in the clarification so increasing pressure on indigenous hamlets in smaller settlements you could find them in the 18th and 19th century all over new england and by the mid 19th century there's really a few of the larger native american reserves that are able to survive in southern new england and these reserves, by the time the Civil War rolls around, face a dramatic challenge. 
And pretty much the state governments in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, they are passing a policy that is called termination. And it pretty much says, Native Americans, you are no longer Native Americans. We're closing your reserves. Here, everyone gets some land and everyone will get some, um, will get maybe some money and you are no longer Native Americans. And Native communities, for the most part, resist this termination policy, but the state governments charge ahead and and terminate the uh, tribes anyway, or the, the, the native reserves and, and the societies. And that becomes an issue later because state governments really aren't supposed to do that because under the constitution, um, this is, uh, these kinds of decisions are part of the federal government and the federal prerogative, which is an entirely difficult subject. And, and if people are interested, we can talk more in the Q and A section about it. Um, staying visible, uh, again, even with termination and, and these challenges, Native Americans continue to gather around in the places where their reserves used to be, and these communities continue to function as indigenous community. They, some, they often retain at least some political control, as do, for example, the Wampanoag Indians in Mashpee until at least World War II. And so they're in charge of town politics. They, they get to make decisions on schools. And again, there's a long proud tradition of, 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 of uh, Native Americans in New England running their own educational institutions. And there's other people, and I've picked Joseph Nicolar of the Penobscot and Gladys Tantequidgen of the Mohegan as just two stand-ins, just like Apis and Betsy Gumbel and Champlain. I could have picked many, many others. Uh, Joseph Nicolau wrote a book uh, that was very influential and, and is a very unique uh, view on Penobscot history. A man that was self-taught and in his scholarship, oh my God, so far ahead of people in the late 19th and 20th century in terms of his perception and, and, and so on. And Gladys Tantequidgen was a very interesting woman. Um, she trained as a traditional Mohegan uh, healer. So she had an incredible wealth of knowledge on traditional Eastern woodland medicines. She also had a PhD in anthropology from UPenn. Um, with, with her family members, they collected uh, material objects, uh, document sets, everything that related to Mohegan history and the collection her and her family and other members of the Mohegan uh, community gathered would help the community later in the 1970s and 1980s in their fight to regain federal recognition. So while this is a long and dry period and, 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 and Tante Quidgen and others spent a lot of time accumulating and, and helping to retain their communities, uh, it, it was a long struggle for these communities to be recognized again. Of course, there is other challenges and other legacies. An often discussed issue are the boarding schools of the 19th and the 20th century. They often ran under the motto, kill the Indian, I quote, and save the man, unquote. Boarding and residential schools are places of dramatic abuse, uh, sexual molestation, violence. Uh, Native American children who speak their language are beaten. Um, the other issue that is going on in the name of the quote unquote welfare of, of Native American children is family separation. Again, a very sad history throughout the United States where um, Native American children are dragged from their families and, and left in foster care. Now these are um, made illegal under the Indian Welfare Act of 1978, but in the state of Maine, they seem to continue. And those familiar in the audience with the documentary Dawnland, that's, that's what this documentary is about, how this habit um, continues. Uh, 
And if, if you haven't seen Dawnland yet, it's an interesting prism on, on this particular sad episode in New England history and, and in American history, uh, a topic we don't talk about very much. Both the boarding residential schools and the family separation have caused incredible trauma. Um, having talked to boarding school survivors, how they did not teach their children their indigenous language. So there's that language of the issue of, of language loss going on here too. Uh, that is very, um, it's a very sad and very depressing story. Um, and again, we, as with Christianity, right? The problem with these talks is we're just scratching the surface. But at the same time, it's important to hear these stories and important to scratch the surface so that, that, uh, that we create some awareness. Um, I, we're getting close to me talking for 50 minutes and that is m way more than I should be. So I wanna just wrap up the story. The indigenous civil rights struggle continues. Uh, what has happened since World War II? Several Native American communities have gained state and federal recognition. They have won cases in the court system. Uh, they have, have won land claims cases. Now, not every indigenous community and not every Native American community in New England is federally or state recognized. That is a very expensive process to undergo and not every community has these types of resources. And as many Native Americans will also tell you that it is just another sad example that they have to ask someone to get their identity verified. And for some communities, they just are not interested in that kind of, uh, in that kind of situation. Indigenous nationalism, sovereignty and activism continues. Uh, there's a lot of activism throughout New England about Deer Island, uh, about uh, for, a, a, I'm sorry, every Thanksgiving at Plymouth, uh, Plymouth, uh, in, in Plymouth math, there is, is, is uh, a day of mourning. Um, so, so, so these are again, just two examples of a lot of things that are going on. Like many other communities in the United States, native indigenous communities are facing issues with economic and cultural revitalization. Language preservation is a big issue for many communities. Uh, getting jobs into especially rural communities uh, and how to keep your culture strong. And that is, is a continuous challenge, but also many indigenous communities in New England are rising to that challenge. And with that, I want to go over to question, questions and answers. So we have at least uh, 35 minutes for that. And I am going to uh, stop my share now so we can open things up. Thank you, Christoph. That was really amazing. In fact, somebody in the chat said you should just keep talking. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've talked enough. I've been talking since 5 a.m. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the first question we have is from Judy. She says, how do you feel about our current history books and how they depict Native Americans? Are the facts, I'm going to put this in quotes, romanticized or something else? This is a tough question because I think there is some textbooks that do a better job with it, some don't. And so I think if you read something and you find it romanticized, it, it probably sometimes is. And sometimes it's also sort of a, a, a human, um, well, almost a human caricature of people. So could we do a better job integrating Native Americans into the history curriculum? Absolutely. Are there a lot of teachers that are interested in that? Absolutely, I, I, I have spent a lot of time on teacher workshops, talking to teachers. And I, I think a lot of people want to do more. They just don't necessarily feel that there's a lot of tools. And I've spent like years of studying this stuff. And I have to just, often I just shake my head about my own ignorance and, and all the stuff that I had to unlearn and have to still unlearn. Uh, and, and even in presentations like that, you're trying to hit every point, but then yes, Christianity also has another side to it. Sorry, I muted myself. 
Thank you. That's okay. Um, so I think it's Martha on chat says, what is the history of indigenous people in the territory that became Lexington? Who was here? How is it that they disappeared? Sarah is the better person to talk to that. I, I'm familiar with lots of communities and uh, I, 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 I know zilch about Lexington. Sarah, do you have an, any ideas about it? <laughs> so we, we were talking really briefly about this earlier and from what I understand, not, not being an expert um, in this at all, but from what I was able to find from some other sources when this question um, came up, is that I do not believe that there was an active settlement in Lexington, um, mainly because native settlements tended to focus around rivers um, and places where there were travel ways and good sources of water, which Lexington doesn't necessarily have. And so you would have um, a, a decent sized community over on the Concord River and then closer to Boston with Lexington kind of being a, a middle ground where people were really just sort of passing through for the most part. Um, so if anyone has more uh, concrete information on that, do feel free to put it in the chat because I do not have any particular sources for this, um, but just from, from what I've found to talking to some of the people at the Concord Museum um, and just some of the other research that's out there. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, in the chat, feel free to add your own information if you if you know of any of her, particularly about Lexington. So in the Q and A, Andy has a, a pretty long um, question that is complex. Um, I'm interested in the analysis that interaction with Europeans in the pre-colonial period, i.e., interaction with European fur traders, exacerbated intertribal warfare. Do historians believe that Algonquin political society existed in a state of equilibrium, more or less, that communities were stable and lived in peace with each other, or was intertribal warfare common prior to the arrival of Europeans? What evidence is there that European contact exacerbated intertribal warfare? And if there was war in natural Algonquin society, what was typically the impetus for war? Yeah, that's a very complex question indeed. In fact, I'm teaching an entire course on this this semester, and I don't think we're answering that question. Um, so there is, again, sort of the romanticized, there was all peace, and then sort of the, the, the old tired stereotypes of either the, the, the brutal, quote unquote, Native American, and, and usually they use the, the French word for, or the English word, coming from the French word sauvage, uh, or sauvage, or savage, right, quote unquote. Um, so we have the noble and the innoble stereotype. And I think this is what, what, what I think it was Andy was referring to. So yes, there, there, there certainly was, I'm sure, conflict in uh, Native American society pre-contact. Um, pre and there is archeological evidence in New England uh, as well as in other areas. The New England situation, probably not as, as, as violent of battles as in other parts of, of the Eastern Woodlands. When you look at the more, um, the larger and, 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 and uh, more hierarchical societies of the Midwest and the South, where you have these mound building uh, societies that have tremendous temple complexes, cities of dramatic sizes that, that hold up in comparative size with the places in Europe, the major cities. Um, so New England, the small war is small scale, but um, it does heat up. And there is again, some good evidence in terms of archeological finds of firearms in native communities. Uh, the the Mi'kmaq Indians up North uh, that are sometimes called Tarantines in colonial record, they obtain guns through the French and they'd bring it in. The Haudenosaunee or Iroquois, the rest there is, is gone. And so there is a lot of pressure on the indigenous communities in New England from these armed communities. And so they're, they're having to keep these people at bay. So I, I don't think there's a state of peace, but I also don't want to over, uh, overstate that. Communities tend to sometimes get into conflicts 
and people that live in communities try the darndest to keep their families and their communities safe, so. Very true. Um, Mona Roy from uh, Lexington says, maybe we can look to bring Dawnland to the library for an online streaming as part of a program. I think that would be awesome. Um, um, Oz D, I'm, I'm gonna say this wrong, Oz D Lexma <laughs> asks, did the re-recognition of terminated tribes happen more in New England or the rest of the US? It is so complex. Um, Um, it, it happened some in New England, maybe, maybe less so than in other areas. A lot of communities are still struggling to get recognized or have given up or never tried. Um, there is sort of these ingrained stereotypes of what it is to be a Native Americans and the process is very hard. And so I think because of the long history of colonization and the requirements of making a case for federal recognition. It becomes very hard. And so I think I can maybe answer it in that way. It is a harder task to tackle for communities here than it might be out West where um, the history is more recent. Okay, thank you. Um, and it, um, actually somebody had asked about Lexington and somebody wrote in the chat, there was a trail or trade route that ran through Lexington that went from Waltham to Salem. So that's interesting. Um, Nancy, who I think you know, um, at, said on the same subject as the first question, Christianity did not save the praying Indians from being sent to Deer Island or suffering other yeah. abuses from what I understand. Yeah, that's no, great. absolutely. And I mean, the, the sad irony of this is that you have people on Deer Island, uh, their families dying, starving, and they're signing up to fight on the side of the New English. Uh, because the New English are just too um, incapable of fighting King William's war, uh, not sorry, King, King Philip's war. So th they need to have the Mohawks come in uh, to help the, the New English colonists out, but also its indigenous allies. And so it's, it's, a, very, it's a very sad story here. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so you have people getting off the island, fighting on side of, on, along the side of English, um, negotiating with the Nipmucks and, and the Wampanoags who are like hiding in central Massachusetts for the release of New English captives while their own families are on Deer Island. So yes, I, I mean, I don't, again, Nancy, I'm sorry, but yeah, yeah you are correct. That is part of that history too. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so Andy asks, I am not a historian, but I've read some books about King Philip's war, and I wonder what the source is for the speculation that seven out of 10 of the 30,000 Native Americans in Southern New England in 1670 were killed in King Philip's war. Yeah. Seven out of 10 sounds plausible for the hostile tribes, i.e. the Narragansetts and the Wampanoags, perhaps, but seven out of 10 in all of New England, given that the Connecticut tribes and the remnant Massachusetts and Pawtucket Indians were allied with the English. Yeah, but the remnant Pawtucket Indians, Penacook up in Lowell, they're already in the mountains of New Hampshire and, and pretty much get, um, by 1680s, they're out of their homeland. Um, I mean, they're kind of hanging up on, out on one island for a couple of years after King Philip's War. 14 of their kids that I have documented are like sold into um, indentured servitude in Chelmsford. Um, so the, the source that I'm using here is the, a scholar named David Silverman. Uh, who is sort of the, the dean. The other person who's written a book uh, is, is Lisa Brooks uh, on her Our Beloved Kin. And then another good source on this is, is a woman who now who used to teach at um, Mount Holyoke, who's now at Williams College. It's a book called Memory Lands. Uh, the, Christine DeLucia uh, is, is her name. And, and that's where this is drawn. And this is why I also said, um, this is what some historians say, maybe it's 50. And whenever we're talking about numbers like 90% mortality rate or 140,000 Indians living in New England, I'm always very careful when I use these numbers. And I think I pointed out in those times that these are approximations. These are based on some estimates. Uh, so Andy might be right that it's not that dramatic. But then if you also count in the two th one to 2,000 people that are sold into slavery, and then the other 
hundreds, maybe thousands. I mean, you look talking about the Pawtuckets and the uh, and the Panacook Indians who are then pushed up north. Uh, I think there, it's 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 quite feasible that the seven is is realistic too. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Judy says, Jane, sorry. What lessons can Native Americans teach us as to forest and fire management? Well, are we opening up a can of worms there because it's all about climate change or it's all about the tree combusting that hasn't been picked up. Um, I think there's much about sustainability uh, that we can learn, but this in itself is, is a talk that someone that is on the environmental side and an environmental scientist would be way better suited than me. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry for taking a cop out. That's a very good question, but I, I am a firm believer in giving experts a voice and I am pleading not ignorance here, but I am not smart enough to answer that question satisfactorily. So I'm not going to attempt that. Sorry for taking a cop out. Sorry. <laughs> I think you probably are smart enough, but maybe that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have a question set that's, can you talk a little about Roger Williams and his interaction with the Native Americans? That's Rhode Island. They're, they're their own thing. <laughs> um, there is a book and I'm blanking on the guy. It's a popular history. And I think I have it somewhere here on my shelf. I would recommend that because um, it's a very good read. Um, this is a very broad question. Does, can the person uh, hone in? I mean, Roger Williams, maybe to just tackle it, is clearly ahead of his Puritan neighbors in the treatment of Native Americans in trying to uh, come up with better ways of, 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 of sharing the land with the Narragansett Indians. But all of that comes out in pretty badly in King William's War. The Puritans, of course, blame the Narragansetts for being aggressive. The Narragansetts, of course, are saying, well, we only joined the war because you massacred, massacred us during the, um, during the um, Great Swamp Massacre. So this is hard to trace back. But yes, Rhode Island is certainly an interesting experiment as there seems to be more of an attempt to, to find a, a more interactive and civil life between Native Americans and, and, and New English, but maybe there's also some romanticization that is going on there. So I hope that is, it's kind of a cop-out answer again, but that's, that I'll take, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, Andy says the book is James A. Warren's God, War, and Providence. Yes, that's it. And it's, it's a good read. Awesome. Um, I feel like I'm going to have this whole big te you know, pile of books I'm going to have to read after this. Um, Judy asks, is the current legislation in Massachusetts dealing with recognition or are there other issues being addressed? On, on what particular issue? Sorry. Um, it doesn't say, but I, if there's anything in particular that you know about. Um, I, I, I don't. Is this about the, the seal or, or um, some other recognition? Um, Judy, could you just put that in the chat, like exactly what you're looking for? Sorry um, about that. No, that's okay. Um, just current legislation, she says. Well, the issue with a lot of Native American issues there, it's a federal prerogative. Um, that the, it's, it's really a federal government affair. So in some instances like Massachusetts, for example, recognize the Nipmuc nation of, of central Massachusetts, um, but those are very, very different things. And so it's like indigenous affairs are, are usually a prerogative of the federal government. So the, the Massachusetts government has actually very little impact on, on those negotiations. In some instances, for example, with, with like recognition issues with the Mashpee Wampanoags, for example, you've had a lot of local politicians and, and congressmen and senators that have been very much supportive of communities and, and speaking up. And especially in, in, the, in the recent kerfuffles with the Trump administration, it's, it's the um, 
the Massachusetts uh, political structure has been very supportive of the community, uh, at least in, in, in that respect. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Think about too. Um, I know Steve is talking in the in the sidebar as well about how the Puritan ethos is sort of still affecting especially marginalized communities today. So it's useful to to know as well, not only that you know history tends to repeat itself and that it's not linear, but also you know what's local and what's federal and all of this. Um. Yeah, thank you. There's a lot of information actually in the chat that's really interesting, both about the, some of the questions that came up and um, I typed in some of the books that you had mentioned as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. Mona wants to know, if you're familiar with Tuck and Yang, what are your thoughts on their paper on decolonization not being a metaphor? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with them. So if, if the person, I would appreciate the citation, um, I, I'm not familiar with that. Sorry, I, I have big gaps in my knowledge. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to ask Mona to send us some more information about that. That'd be great. Thank you, Mona. And um, I had a question that came up about, um, I don't know if you can see that in the chat, but she sent you a link. Yeah, I'll try um, to cut and paste it, but it doesn't let me. So maybe now copy and try not to crash the whole thing in the process. <laughs> uh, I, I got the URL. I'll try to check it out, Mona, as soon as I get a chance to breathe, which might be Christmas. <laughs> yes, Sorry. you are a professor. Um, uh, Apurva Muri said it's a great talk. We really enjoyed it. Uh, I wanted yeah, to ask how are you. <laughs> I wanted to ask you um, something that you had said early on in your talk about, um, you know, Squantum knowing how did he know how, how to teach the, uh, the Puritans, you know, all that he knew and that that there had been like traitors and things before that. I wonder if you think or if there's some thought about if this if the things that had happened were sort of inevitable because it was always going to be, you know, movement around the world by different people, you know, and 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 they were just always taking over. They were always colonizing and treating people poorly. So I wonder if you think if it would, it, you know, this kind of stuff was inevitable or was there any opportunity for that to, it to be different? That's, that's a very good question. And I think this is sort of one of the defining important questions of, of our lifetime. Um, yeah, one would hope that that wasn't the case, but maybe it is within human nature. And there's plenty of examples of the Mongols and history, et cetera, et cetera. Conquest happens and it, it tends to be ugly. And so maybe it is inevitable or maybe we need to, as human beings, be better about it. So. Yeah, so I mean, can I, jump in for a minute. Sure, Sarah. Um, so this, this actually came up in um, a previous talk that we had um, with someone who wasn't as much um, of a, a specific um, expert as you are. And uh, I think people were, were kind of intrigued by this. Um, when, you're, when you're writing these histories, when you're teaching these histories as a historian, how do you work with the oral traditions of Native Americans? Because I feel like that is somewhat contentious in some circles. I, I know having been to say the Wampanoag Museum, they. I, I felt bad the poor woman who was giving a tour said, yes, this was written down. It's not just tradition. We know that this happened. Um, and, and how do you grapple with that dilemma? Well, for my current project, I stayed away from oral histories or I, I used oral histories, et cetera, but I, I, I stayed away from talking to specific people. Um, because I was concerned that talking to one group and not of another group, it would create discrepancies within the narrative. And what I've tried to, to do with my, the, the, the last book I wrote, it, it was really sort of trying to work on a synthesis that general readers could pick up and, and, and understand and learn more about, about New England Native American history. Um, I have done oral histories with recent immigration populations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I'm a historian, I tend to not get too, I think these um, disciplinary and 
and methodological debates are, are important, but unlike other social scientists as a historian, I'm, I might be a little bit old school and maybe a fuddy-duddy and somewhat dated, but part of me is of, of history is also story and granted it's his and so it's very, uh, very male centric, but, but story, stories are important to me and oral histories are great ways to, to tell stories. And, and so it's, it's, it's a good prism. You match it up with archeological historical documentation, the oral historical record, you can learn from all of those sources. And chances are, if you can find it in all three of them, you've got a slam dunk. And until I have it in all three of them, I often say, yeah, maybe blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's actually a great segue into our last question from Kelly. Um, although Katie says, thank you so much. There's so much to learn. Kelly asks at the end, which is now, would you ask what I'm asking you to go back to the beginning? What was the indigenous oral history about the first Thanksgiving meal? So again, this is another book by uh, David Silverman, who, um, who I've mentioned earlier. Uh, he discusses that in his latest book on, um, on, on, I think it's called This Land is Their Land, uh, which is sort of more of a Wampanoag-centered account of the story. The Wampanoags themselves, um, the way I understand it from Wampanoags I have talked to, they tell a story that some of them were in the vicinity of Plymouth and they heard guns firing. They were concerned about what was going on. They showed up and the um, pilgrims were preparing this Thanksgiving and were firing some guns in the air as a, as a celebration. And then the Wampanoags brought some, some deer and, 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 and joined the festivities. But it's not, it's also sort of a more cautious tale and it's not necessarily also celebratory because the Wampanoags were watching the, um, the uh, Puritans very carefully and, and had some concerns. And while um, Osama Quinn, who's often colloquially known as by his, by his title as Massasoit, uh, ended up seeking a close relationship and pushed for that in his policy and pushed the, the Wampanoag Indians into that position. I don't think that necessarily everyone in Wampanoag society was approving of that position. And there were, I'm sure, several Wampanoags that would have liked to um, attack the, the, the Plymouth colony and try to wipe it out. So there is um, Massasoit or Osamaquin makes the bargain. He thinks that a close relationship with, the, with, the, with Plymouth can strengthen his position. He's of course worried about the Narragansett. He's of course worried about the Massachusetts and other Native American communities. So there is a lot of politicking that is going on. And just as when Squanto teaches the, the, the um, Plymouth colonists about farming, about how to navigate the, the waterways, I think Tisquanta might also have tried to manipulate things a little bit and try to improve his standing in Wampanoag society as well. So um, it's a very complex human story uh, that, that, that is fun to unravel. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, before we dismiss the class, I wanted to say thank you, of course, to Christoph Shovel for this amazing conversation that um, I feel like we've all learned so much and need to learn so much more. Um, I also wanted to let you know, because we're talking about Thanksgiving, is um, on November 18th, we are hosting Lois Frank. She's a Native American chef, and she's going to be talking about the real Thanksgiving dinner. And she's actually going to be doing a demonstration of a couple of um, dishes that could might have been at the Thanksgiving meal, might have not. Um, but she's going to be talking about the real thing. So um, again, I'd like to thank Christophe for this wonderful, wonderful talk and all of your um, information that we have learned from and Sarah for um, helping us with this program and always um, supporting Cary Library programs um, 
in, co in collaboration. And I'd like to thank everybody that's here because um, you took the time to learn about this really important topic. So I appreciate that as well. So thank you so much, Christoph. And um, this has been really wonderful. Thank you guys for having me. And it's my pleasure and, and have a good evening, everyone. Try to get some rest, be kind, wash your hands, put on the mask, all that good stuff. Hang in there. Bye-bye. <laughs> awesome. Bye-bye.